Greetings, I'm your host, Dr. Wolfie Lynn. When I'm not heading to Mardi Gras just to get all the free beads, I'm here at the Wolfie Lair reviewing movies. For my previous review, I covered Friday the 13th Part 7, so I figured why not cover another Kane Hodder slash John Carl Beekler collaboration with a review of Hatchet, written and directed by Adam Green and released in 2006. And no, it's not the film adaptation of the Gary Paulson novel of the same name featuring a boy surviving and coming of age deep in the Canadian wilderness. No, it's the slasher film. I saw Hatchet 15 years ago when it was first released, and it was seriously hyped in the horror community, and for good reason. The 2000s may have been one of the worst decades for the horror genre, even worse than the 90s, with endless amounts of remakes for the sake of remakes without care put into any of them, usually made by music video directors who probably didn't even see the horror movies they were remaking. The Omen, for instance, was only remade because the release date could be June 6, 2006. Oh, I get it, 666. A marketing gimmick is a real great reason to remake a classic movie. Hollywood was starting to truly realize the value of their horror icons, but they simultaneously didn't respect the horror genre when they capitalized on it. So you just ended up with a lot of extra sludge churned out of Hollywood during this period. It did have a tendency to rise out of the dirt, so we like to keep them all cemented in instead. So you can understand why Hatchet, an indie horror film throwback to the Friday the 13th series starring Kane Hodder with effects work by John Carl Beekler and a whole bunch of horror cameos, would be heralded so much by horror fans at the time. It was 10 years after it seemed like Scream was going to reinvigorate the horror genre, and Hatchet was absolutely nowhere near the hit Scream was, but it seemed like it maybe could have been. I need everyone to be over enthusiastic or you'll wind up overboard. <laughs> I remember the excitement surrounding just the first poster for the film, with the tagline reading, It's not a remake, it's not a sequel, and it's not based on a Japanese one. Old school American horror. It seems silly now to advertise a movie as just not being based on another thing, but this poster was an absolute indictment of the state of horror at the time, and promised that the film it was promoting would be something truly special. Is Hatchet special, especially 15 years later? Well, let's find out in my riff view. The film begins with a cold opening featuring a father and son hunting for gators in a swamp at night. Robert England, aka Freddy Krueger, playing the dad, and playing the son is... Holy shit, it's Josh from the Blair Witch Project! This film has a major horror celebrity in it. Come on, Paul, we've been out here over three hours. I mean, we don't even know where the hell she went. I ain't leaving here without her. Anyway, after Daddy Kruger here emasculates his pissing son and says some expository dialogue about the boy's sister. No matter what I say, shut up, Ainsley, or you're queer, Ainsley, or why can't you be more like your sister, Ainsley? Josh here wanders off in the woods alone because it worked out just fine for him that last time. And after his private piss, he returns to find that his father will have to settle on killing gators in their dreams from now on. Josh is next to be viciously dismembered, and I can only assume some of these teeth and entrails are what Heather found in that bundle of sticks. Oh God, help me! After a goofy intro sequence involving a cartoon sewer you'd see in a PS2 game, we find ourselves in the middle of Mardi Gras in the Big Easy, Nolens. In the middle of a disgusting, humid day where New Orleans' lack of basic infrastructure is on full display. The music tries to make this party seem cool, but most of the people here look like they're nearly ready to cash in their social security checks. It's like the filmmakers got their aunts and uncles to play extras in this scene. A lot of sad breasts are on display, but I guess that's the grim reality of Mardi Gras unfortunately. It's here where we meet the main characters of this movie. Ben, played by Joel Moore, and Marcus, played by Dion Richmond. I'm gonna go find something to do. What, by yourself? I know what you might be thinking, but no, Marcus is not the black guy from Psych. He played Bud on The Cosby Show, but funnily enough, on Psych, they made jokes about Gus looking like Bud from The Cosby Show, and then eventually Bud actually showed up in Psych's series finale. I know what you also might be thinking, and yes, this other motherfucker looks precisely like a real-life Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. It's like God sculpted this dude into Shaggy's image. It's insane. Anyway, uh, Shaggy and Bud are taking in Mardi Gras, but Shaggy recently recently went through a breakup and is not in the mood to look at pairs of upsetting breasts. He instead wants to go on a boat tour through a haunted swamp. DeWitt and Robinson told me about this haunted swamp tour thing that they did last year. They said it was amazing. Wow, that's when you know Shaggy is really heartbroken if he's willing to do something spooky, which his friends, including Adam Green, refuse to participate in. Ben, wait up, wait up, wait up, man. I'll go. Marcus, no, go ahead. No, 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 I'm going with you. It's cool. 
Only Bud reluctantly joins Shaggy in his insistent pursuit of a swamp ride, and the duo encounters Tony Todd cosplaying Dr. Facilier, who would be a perfect character to center the movie around as the swamp tour guide, but unfortunately, the movie only had enough budget to pay for a Tony Todd cameo. Can't do night tours anymore. Insurance got too high. So Tony Todd instead tells Shaggy and Bud to go to another tour guide. Be careful walking on the sidewalk. I'm not gonna lie, this two-minute Tony Todd cameo is one of the few things I remembered from watching this movie 15 years ago, to the point where I actually believed Tony Todd was a major character. That might be a bad sign, but Tony Todd does return as Reverend Zombie in the sequels, at least. At the other haunted swamp tour place, Shag and Bud encounter a trio of the film's other victims, I mean vitally important characters, a sleazy pornographic filmmaker and two bimbos he found off the streets of New Orleans with the intent of filming the latest installment in his Bayou Beavers video series, which is pretty good alliteration, I must admit. I need you guys to show me the love, all right? I need to feel the passion here, all right? More importantly, the duo is acquainted with the haunted swamp tour's guide, a flamboyantly dressed fellow with the basic name of Sean. The spirits of the damned are on the rise. Let's get our souls on the move, my friends. Who does a bad, stereotypical Cajun accent that would certainly offend any Cajun people listening if they were sober enough to be offended by anything. But we all know Cajuns are never fucking sober, though. <laughs> <laughs> Leaving right now, a four to bones each. Forty dollars? To balance out the undercurrent of rampant sleaziness in the movie, also joining the Haunted Swamp Tour is a wholesome middle-aged couple, Jim and Shannon Permateo, one of whom is the one guy in office space who failed to kill himself, and the other one was in that episode of Seinfeld where George tried to slip his former boss a Mickey. Both those things were so fucking funny. <laughs> Oh, have mercy. We've got ourselves a director over here. What kind of movie is it? Have you ever heard of Bayou Beavers? Sure. No. no. Oh, then there's the other character introduced here, the obvious survivor girl of the film, Mary Beth, played by Tamara Feldman, who had her character recast by Daniel Harris in the three subsequent sequels, but I'm sure if Adam Green had his way, he would have tignataroed Tamara Feldman out of this first movie, too. Some buddies of mine back home went on this tour. Look, I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't come on this tour because I was hoping that just maybe I'd get to meet you. Well, the group departs on their boat ride, but not before receiving a dire warning from Cracker Jack, a cameo by the late John Carl Beekler. This swamp is closed! Victor Crowley! What's he saying? Who is an even more credible harbinger of doom than Crazy Ralph. You know, if you ignore the fact that he drinks his own urine. Uh, sits there, yells things, uh, drinks his own piss. I'd still trust his word. Eventually, things go south due to the negligence and general inexperience experience of the tourist guide, who crashes the boat, and as the tourists flee, Jim is bitten by a Louisiana swamp tiger. But luckily, Mary Beth is revealed to have an iron on her and starts calling the shots literally. <laughs> but more importantly, she also delivers crucial exposition. If we don't get out of these woods right now. We're all gonna die. Not everyone might know what a Jason Voorhees is, so it's nice of the film to go out of its way to explain the basics of what a Jason Voorhees is. These are his woods. Whose woods? Victor Crowley. Essentially, this movie's Jason Voorhees is named Victor Crowley, played by Kane Hodder, reprising his role as Jason Voorhees by playing another Jason Voorhees. In the flashback, Hodder even plays his character's own father. You get double the Kane Hodder for your money in this film. But yeah, Victor Crowley's backstory is basically Jason Voorhees' backstory, but with a dad instead of a mom and no camp. Victor's still an ugly Charlie Brown looking kid, and the local children bully him for his Eric Stoltz mask deformities, but there's also some Freddy Krueger thrown in the mix when teens eventually set Victor's shack on fire. Kane Hodder has seen his fair share of fire stunts and attempts to rescue his beloved weird-looking son by storming through the blaze with a hatchet, but unfortunately Victor ends up with an even more fucked up looking head in the process, supposedly dying, leaving Victor's father Kane Hodder to die of a broken heart and become one with the force. You can still hear Victor Crowley crying for his daddy in the woods. Hatchet's backstory is very basic and derivative. This movie is transparently a Friday the 13th homage, so the film is trying to use as much of Jason's familiar elements while also changing things just enough to slide by without legal trouble. If you're following the formula of a Friday the 13th movie, it can provide the freedom to still reinvent the killer, backstory, and surroundings, so the film can stand on its own, but it seems like they just didn't want to take the risks. Hatchet was sold as being an original horror movie, but the irony is that it's more along the lines of a fan 
Batman film, a Friday the 13th spiritual successor, which is totally fine, but honestly, Hatchet isn't very successful at effectively replicating in several areas what makes Friday the 13th movies great. You know what, Jackie Tucker? Your tour sucks my ass. What did you just call me? The movie doesn't do a great job establishing Victor Crowley as a strong presence throughout the film that is an inescapable inevitability like Jason. Besides the opening murders, there's very little hint to Victor Crowley's presence for another half hour, and this movie is only 80 minutes long, shorter than any Friday the 13th film. Contrast this with a Friday the 13th sequel where Jason's presence is established early on and we're constantly reminded of him throughout, wondering when he'll strike next and often seeing him do just that, making him this large larger than life figure that occupies your imagination. Of course, Victor Crowley is eventually introduced in grand fashion when the middle-aged couple attempts to approach his cabin for assistance and the hillbilly emerges from within and just goes totally sick house on the injured husband and, just so you guys know, despite this movie being called Hatchet, this is the only kill with a hatchet in the whole movie. <laughs> Victor Crowley more often uses brute strength to kill people. Like when he gets all King Kong on this bitch. Savage as fuck! <laughs> Honestly though, the film peaks early right here with that awesome kill with the viscera, blood, and moving tongue. The kills going forward are a lot less memorable and unfortunately all the movie has to offer past this point is kills. Hatchet goes in a direction with its plot that can make or break any slasher movie script. The killer makes himself known to all the characters early on. If you watch most Friday the 13th movies, most of the characters are completely unaware that a killer is around until the last 15 or 20 minutes. Same goes for most Halloween movies or slasher films in general. The subgenre thrives on dramatic irony. The audience knows something that the characters don't know, and this builds up suspense, and in a skillful writer's hands, this provides an opportunity to really play with the expectations of your audience about who will die next, how it'll happen, and when. Now, if you reveal your killer early in your slasher script to all the characters, that's not necessarily the death of your screenplay, but it means you gotta work overtime to keep things exciting when kills aren't happening. Keeping the characters moving, making decisions, maintaining suspense, juggling multiple characters, and keeping the villain as a credible threat with an edge over his group of aware victims. I thought it was a ghost. You can't shoot a ghost. You can't shoot a ghost. Did you kill him? I don't know. If you can't manage all of that, then you end up falling into the same trap as Hatchet, where the characters are lost in a twilight zone of comical inaction. Where you have one of your characters witness two people brutally murdered, and he proceeds to hide up in a tree like he's in a Scooby-Doo episode. This is bullshit, man. This is fucked up. I'm surprised it's not Shaggy doing this shit. The characters just spend a lot of time not doing anything that indicates that they have a strong desire to survive. But you knew your way around here. Oh, set the fucking tour guide. Oh, hey, I don't want to hit you, but you're making your... Shut the they just bicker with each other while walking blindly through the swamp in different directions, letting us know that there's no cell phone signal, which, you know, was at least pretty credible in 2006. Will you just dial? It won't let me. Character revelations are thrown in the mix, but they aren't really relevant at all at this point when there's a murderer on the loose. Mary Beth joined the tour to find her daddy Freddy and brother Joshua who were killed in the opening. Sean the tour guide is really just a guy from Detroit who only ever did one tour before, and the sleazy pornographic filmmaker was actually just a regular sleazy dude who only taped porn for his private collection. I flew all the way down here from New York and he... This detail is discovered after the man gets his head twisted 180 degrees. Who fucking cares if he wasn't a real porn producer at this point? He's fucking dead! And the characters who are all alive to care about this information act like it's the most shocking shit that's happened that night. Why are all men such slime? It's like this movie is desperately trying to invent new details at the last minute that will hopefully add extra layers of depth to the characters when they should just be trying their best to not die. I didn't really go to NYU. It was my first choice, but I didn't get it. I know Hatchet might be a tongue-in-cheek comedic horror movie, but the characters can still be funny and not be total fucking idiots with the attention spans of gnats. It makes the characters from the Friday the 13th movie seem like they're intelligent, savvy, pouring over with depth, and with expert-level survival instincts. At least with the Friday the 13th movies, the characters have the excuse of not knowing there's a killer around most of the time. With movies like Hatchet and Friday the 13th, though, the main draw is the killer and their killings, and I gotta say, Kane Hodder offers a fine performance 
performance as Victor Crowley, but Crowley himself feels half-baked. It's just Jason from part two without a sack on his head and looking like he got stung by a bunch of bees. It feels like a rough draft of Jason Voorhees or just a placeholder villain until they came up with something better later. There are some good kills, but they aren't paced out all that well so you can have some time to take each one in. By the time you realize Victor Crowley has belt sanded this chick's face off, he's moved on to dismembering the goofy, funny tour guide with a shovel and then impaling the chick on said shovel. It just all happens a little too rapidly in succession and it doesn't feel like the characters make any effort to prevent their deaths. They just let themselves die because they're scripted to die. Oh, screw this. <laughs> It doesn't help this movie's case either that it just has a generic orchestral score instead of music that's atmospheric and more authentic to the slasher movies this film tries to connect itself to. How is Victor Crowley going to stand on his own if he doesn't have his own theme music? <laughs> Things get ridiculous when the characters, instead of just leaving the 500 foot radius surrounding Victor Crowley's shack and actually trying to escape, they decide to try to team up and kill the guy. If we don't kill him, he'll kill us all. It really does feel like the Friday the 13th games version of a Friday the 13th movie, where the killer makes himself known to everybody right away and you gotta troll the killer until the timer goes off. After the blonde is killed off screen, the gang decides to set Victor Crowley on fire because it worked really well the first time it happened, but God is on their side when it just suddenly starts raining. God really wants to see a couple more motherfuckers get killed. All this bodice is time, don't waste it. Come on. The trio of survivors flee to a nearby cemetery, which shows that they were much closer to civilization than they realized, but are cornered by Crowley, who throws his hatchet that just bounces off a little statue because it is in fact made out of rubber. After Victor Crowley treats Shaggy like he's his younger brother spitting a loogie in the guy's mouth, Shaggy breaks free, but Victor ends up ripping Bud's arms off and smashing him against a wall, which should have been fucking Shaggy. Bud just wanted to stay in New Orleans and see some titties, but decided to support his friend who very specifically wanted to go on a haunted swamp tour. Bud should have been the survivor in this movie. He did nothing wrong and was punished for it. <laughs> Shaggy does get a boot full of fence posts though, but uses it to his advantage Spartan style against the hulking brute. But Shaggy still gets some more bodily fluids in his face. The two finally escape on the boat left behind by Freddy Krueger at the start of the movie, but like in any Friday the 13th movie, it's not a good idea to go on a boat, as Mary Beth is pulled underwater by Victor, who doesn't kill her right away for some reason, and she emerges to find Shaggy in quite the shaggy state, along with a very cheery Victor Crowley. Yeah, this movie ends on a total cliffhanger, and the sequel didn't come out for another four years, so it's safe to say I kind of lost interest in what happened next after all that time passed. We made it. Now, I've been down on Hatchet in this video, but it's not a bad movie at all, and the series has its fans. It's just kind of a middle-of-the-road horror movie, especially in the years since. It was a big deal when it came out because there was very little in the way of real competition in the horror scene, but the movie doesn't compare well to its predecessors and makes no effort to improve upon the work done in the Friday the 13th series. So Hatchet does feel like a minor footnote in horror history that's mostly notable just for coming out during a time when there was very little new horror worth watching but maybe the Hatchet sequels improve on the original. They fucking better, because I'm gonna be reviewing them next, and if they suck, it's gonna really ruin my summer. I will say, though, that Behind the Mask came out the same year as Hatchet, and I have watched that movie multiple times since, and it didn't get a single sequel 15 years later, so there really is no justice in the world. I give Hatchet a Kane Hodder dad out of Kane Hodder's son. If you enjoyed this vid, just know that we have a new secondary channel now called The Gulag, featuring my zombie servant Goulash, who has recently reviewed Scooby-Doo Return to Zombie Island. Link in the description to watch that new video. Well, have you ever heard of Bayou Beavers? Sure. No. no. This video is made possible through the pledges of my Patreon supporters, and I'd like to give a very special thanks to the kind folks pledged to my shoutouts tier. All of the support on Patreon means a lot to me, and it helps my dark influence continue to grow. If you like this video, like it, and if you loved it, click the subscribe and bell buttons for more vids. Be sure to also keep in touch by following me on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dr. Wolfula. While I still have your attention, consider pledging to my Patreon to support the channel and get bonus content like previews, VIP 
VIP Discord server access, private movie night streams, and credits in videos. Consider pledging at patreon.com slash drwolfula. Also, check out official Dr. Wolfula t-shirts and other merch on tpublic.com slash user slash drwolfula. Thanks for watching. See you all next time. Dr. Wolfula signing out. Thank <laughs> you.